All right, you ready for me, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. We're All right. I uh, felt like I was doing a lot, some sort of walk of shame there just now, like making people wait. So, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, uh, Senator Shane Morjo, I'm out of Senate District 48 out of Missoula County. Um, and uh, today I bring before you what I think is uh, a great bill um, and something that I, I feel like is much needed um, in Montana and is very much lacking. Um, and, and I'll get that to, to, to in a second here. But um, in 2021, um, the CDC reported that approximately one in 44 children in the United States is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and that was according to a 2018 data. So roughly one in 27 boys and one in 116 girls are identified with autism. And shockingly, um, Montana has may have some services type uh, things available for, for folks in the autism community, but there is no facility in Montana um, for families that need that support. Um, the state will assist in uh, services, but there's just actually no facility here to keep families together in Montana. And um, an example is, I, and maybe you all received this, this email as well, um, but uh, an individual had emailed me um, yesterday and had um, told me that they have a family member who had to go to a, a home in Mississippi um, because we don't have any uh, uh, facilities here to allow them to stay in Montana. So we're providing services to help people go out of state, uh, but we we don't have anything here to, to assist them to keep them with their families. Um, and it's not for, for lack of trying. Uh, you'll hear from some support today that there's folks who um, who've been busting their butts for quite some time to try and acquire property, to try and raise money as 501c3, to try and raise funds to provide these critically in, uh, important services for families that uh, really need it. Um, and so I don't want to go into that detail because I'll, I'll let them talk about the funding they've raised. But what this bill really does is it, you know, it it throws uh, some funds into that pool for, for folks who are going above and beyond to try and raise funding um, for our autism facility in Montana. Um, and so w my bill would provide a one-to-one one -one, one -one match um, and it would provide a funding mechanism um, to actually help support some of these, these folks who have been um, working their tails off. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, I'll step aside because I think hearing these stories and hearing from people who have actually um, been putting in the legwork is more important than hearing another uh, senator uh, ramble on about their bill. So thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Senator Marshall. Um, do we have proponents in the room? Let me ask before we get started. How many people are here as proponents? Just show of hands. Okay, great. And any opponents in the room for this bill? Show of hands. Okay, great. Well, let's go ahead then and... Uh, the committee has a bill following this one that take a lot of time, so just be mindful of that. But I'm not going to put any time limits on you. So the first proponent in the room. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Rich Jansen, spelled J-A-N-S-S-E-N. I was born in Bozeman, reside in Ronan, with my wife Julie, who was born in Sydney. We raised our two children in Ronan. They were both born in Ronan and now are both grown. I fully support Senate Bill 478, and now I will tell you why. Jake, our son, was diagnosed with autism in 1998 at Sherwood Air Hospital about 25 years ago, right here in Helena. He is now 28. He currently lives at home with us and his mother, and he is there right now as we speak, probably watching Thomas the Tank Engine and doing something that he likes to do. About 15 years ago, when Jake was a teenager, we were led to believe that he would reside in a group home here in Montana by the state. Well, that didn't happen. 
We were told we were being proactive in a reactive system. Okay? No homes exist for people like my son and those like him here in Montana. They're limited nationally. They are growing a little bit. But we're in Montana, and SB 478 can help change that. This is a non or a bipartisan bill. It doesn't matter if you have an R or a D behind your name. This is a common sense bill that is long overdue. Why? And I'll tell you why. Well, parents like us are tired. You know, we're worn out. We're unseen. We're forgotten. It's nobody's fault. This is just what is happening globally, nationally, and locally. Okay? The bottom line is parents like us are forced to find adequate full-time supportive housing for our disabled children who are adults because we're going to die, right? Life is finite. As we get older, it gets to be more difficult for us to raise our kids. My son is six foot two, 260. I had aspirations for him. You know, we've dealt with law enforcement three times in 25 years. He's a big man. Okay, we replaced many doors, many toilets, fixed walls, spent thousands of dollars to keep our home safe and our life calm. My wife has PTSD from past conflicts with our son because he can't effectively communicate. I am very thankful that we live in the community that we do because they know Jake. If it got so bad where I had to make a choice between sending him to Mississippi or keeping him here in Montana, I want to keep him here in Montana, right? Montana residents like him deserve to stay at home. They deserve to be next to their family, where their roots are, to be with their peers, where they can flourish, where they can grow as members of their community. Okay, Shane already talked about the numbers of autism. My son was diagnosed 25 years ago. It was one in 10,000. We had to fight hard to get services for him as a child here in Montana. Brandon's bill, remember that, right? To get accurate information on what constitutes evidence-based intervention and practice. But unfortunately, everyone, the need continues to far exceed the resources available, right? It's only going to add financial strain and personal limbo and a society at large economically diminished. This is difficult, right? These children that are going to become adults that aren't going to be employed need to have a place to go. It's not so much limiting by the, their disability, but our failures to help them flourish. Okay, I think SB 478 can help do that. My wife and I, we started Proactive Living Facility, a nonprofit autism facility. You should have all got the email. I sent a couple of them, right? We've grassroots over $400,000 in four years, okay? Pre-COVID, our architectural drawings for this 4,600 square foot home, built for them, not for you and me, was 750000 now the high end is 1.2 million, right? I think we can get it done for about 850, okay? This agenda needs to be accelerated into a tidal wave that represents real change in these residents of Montana. We gotta quit sending them to Mississippi. Let's invest that money here in Montana. Bring Logan home from Mississippi, bring Dylan home from Mississippi, both Columbia Falls men with severe autism, right? The bottom line, I guess I wrote this, rewrote it. I just fully ask you to support 478. It's a bipartisan bill, good for Montana. We got a big surplus, huge, big, you know, 200,000, it's a great start. We've raised 400. If we can get that, we can get these Montanans home next to their families. You'll hear from some of them online, I'm sure. But 
bottom line is a lot of us can't be here because we're too busy at home raising our children, caring for our children. I'm not saying the state hasn't done what they could do to help because they have. Without their help, I would be bankrupt. Both my wife and I are full-time employees. We work, but then we come home to our son. The weekends are with our son. Okay, we go to work, we come home. My son deserves better. Montanans deserve better like him. It's a population that is growing, and it's not going to stop growing. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Jensen, for your testimony today. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Patrick Iwaki, that's spelled Y-A-W-A-K-I-E, <clears throat> representing the Blackfeet Tribe as well as Red Medicine LLC and today in support of Senate Bill 478. We appreciate Senator Marjo bringing this bill forward. We appreciate this bill creating more financial support for organizations seeking facilities in the effort to expand support services for Montana's autism community. We also stand in support of the previous proponent, uh, which I know personally. Uh, so please support Senate Bill 478 with the due pass. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, with your permission, is it okay if I attend another hearing? Go ahead, Mr. Yawaki. Thank, Thank, you. You Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, further proponents? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, Lauren Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N, um, pediatrician. I um, just want to say that our organization does support more resources for children with developmental disabilities um, because in Montana, we definitely do not have enough. So thank you. Thank you. Are there proponents? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is June Hermanson, H-E-R-M-A-N-S-O-N. -E I have, um, I'm congenitally disabled, and I have spent my professional c career working for and with people with disabilities. What you have before you today is one of the purest forms of grassroots organizing. What the Jensen's have done should be modeled across this state in regard to what they've tried to build for their son. And the, this bill provides a matching opportunity, a partnership between the state and a private group that, that is working to give their son a better life. One of the things that happens for people with disabilities and those that get a, the day of diagnosis changes people's lives, it changes parents' lives, um, it changes parents' vision of the future. When we get to the point where our children, disabled children, become adults, in the back of a parent's mind, you do it yourself. Where's my child going to end up? How are they going to be when I'm gone? Those types of things. When you couple that with the problem of having a disability, it's not always a problem, but it, it can be, um, the future isn't as clear. So as a parent and you're planning for that child's future, you want to know that they have a place to go. Being in a facility, oftentimes we think of people with disabilities going to Warm Springs or Boulder or, or someplace that's out in the wilderness. What the Jensen's have built here is a framework and a model that should be replicated across the state. A small community where, in which their son can go to his home and have an apple at midnight if he wants and not a facility that is so guarded that he can't have that apple at midnight, but he's still in his home community. And those people that know that young man are there still to support him. His parents are still there to support him. He's, he has his own life. He's with his peers. In 1999, there was federal, um, a Supreme Court decision called Olmstead. And you'll hear a lot about that as the session goes on, because the Olmstead decision said that people with disabilities need to be in the most integrated settings that we can possibly make for them, whether that's where they live or work or play. If this community setting where their son has been raised 
has lived. They have a vision for him to stay in that community. If that's not the most, if that's not an integrated setting, I don't know what it is. So, um, like I say, you're going to hear a lot from me the rest of the session about Olmstead, but this is an example. They've built a model. They're asking to be partners with the state, and their son has the right to be fully included in society. Thank you. Thank you. Next proponent, just go ahead and just jump right up there. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Major Robinson, uh, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. I live here in Helena and uh, own a Sage and Oates Trading Post downtown, as well as an architectural design business. Um, I'm here in support of this bill. Um, I wasn't exactly prepared to speak on this, but after hearing Mr. Jensen speak as well, <clears throat> I wanted to... Um, relate why I'm in support of this. Um, we have three children. Uh, one has been adopted since age two and is now 14 years old and has had autism his entire life. And um, so there are, are families that not only have biological children that have those needs, but also uh, take on other people's children as well with those needs. And sometimes they can be very, very se severe. Um, in, in our case, uh, my wife uh, had to step out of the workforce in order to provide care for our, our son. And it has uh, added an additional stress to our household as well. And so uh, for something like this, had there been something like this in place for, for us for, for help and placement, I think it would provide a, a great deal of assistance. So I'm very much in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next proponent. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Jackie Moeller, M-O-H-L-E-R. I'm executive director for Family Outreach. We provide developmental disability services in 12 counties of Southwest Montana. I have 120 staff that serve about 450 individuals. I've also been highly involved in autism services since 2009 when the Children's Autism Waiver came about. I worked on licensure back in 2017. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. I'm also on the board of psychologists. I'm not here representing the board of psychologists today. Um, I really am moved by this. I've worked with a lot of families over the past 20 years with children with autism, um, really trying to help them gain skills as much as possible, live and thrive in the communities. Um, it's always tough over the years to see families who have higher levels of need and meet, need more facility type care and have to move out of the state of Montana. That's always a very difficult decision for families. So to have that type of residential treatment in the state would be greatly valued. We need it all across our state as well too not just in one area of the state. So having this type of funding so others could benefit from it across the state, I'm sure we would see that grow as well too. We need community services and we need residential services within the state of Montana. Um, thank you very much and I urge a do pass. Thank you. Any other proponents in the room? See none? Go ahead. Mr. Chair and Committee, my name is Terry Barney, that's B-A-R-N-E-Y, Helena, Montana, and I do urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and seeing no other proponents in the room will go online, and uh, just again, I ask you to keep your comments brief. I'm just going to limit your uh, testimony online to two minutes, so uh, we'll go ahead with Jana Jensen. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Jana Jensen is not on. Next would be Casey. How about Casey Schreiner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman of the committee. For the record, my name is Casey Schreiner. That's S-C-H-R-E-I-N-E-R. -E -E and uh, I know I have two minutes, but I will point out it's great to see many of my old colleagues and friends in there. You can't see me, so I want to assure you that I've now grown a full head of hair and lost a bunch of weight. Okay. Um, I am the vice president of Alluvian Health here in Great Falls, Montana. We are a nonprofit. So I want to come at you from two different angles. One, from Alluvian Health standpoint, we actually recently bought, in partnership with our community, 
uh, purchase our Roosevelt Elementary School that got, we built new schools in Great Falls, the, the district and the community wanted to offload that. We purchased that as a nonprofit with the intent of building an autism facility. Um, schools in good shape, but remodel uh, and refabrication to in order to co-locate uh, pediatric autism services, um, initially pediatric, that would be able to co-locate ABA services if wanted by families, uh, speech therapy, OT, PT, all in one location so that families have one place, one center that they can go to meet their needs. Um, that is a process that we are in the middle of. Uh, even if we were not to participate in this grant by the time I got going, um, we went down this path because Central Montana, Montana in general, but Central Montana is a desert for these services. We recently tried to apply for a grant through the CDC that required a number of four-year-olds and eight-year-olds that we would have had to have had tracking on every four and eight-year-old in the entire state to meet those minimum requirements for funding because there is not enough data in our state to support many of these federal grants, which means in the world of autism, there just isn't the money in dollars. Uh, personally, I'm the father, as many of you know, of two kids on the autism spectrum. At the age of three years old, my son Aiden wasn't speaking, and we were told he may never be able to say I love you to, to us. Because of early intervention, because the system was a little different a few years ago, Aiden now is a third grader that's in advanced classes, reading at a fifth, sixth grade level, um, doing very well. Services in our area left, and frankly, they left in between my two children. Uh, it's a very different story for my middle child. Part of that is because our, when, when the services left, it was because there wasn't access to providers, and the nonprofits that at the time were offering these services couldn't make Mr. it painful. I know that was two minutes. Go ahead and wrap it up, Mr. Well, Schreiner. Well, okay. Nice to see you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. All right, next uh, proponent online is, is Don uh, Secord. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Don. Hi, um, my name is Dawn Secord, uh, last name Secord, S-E-C-O-R-D. Thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, two minutes just isn't enough to explain my situation. My son is Logan, who is in Mississippi. Um, I have not seen him since January of 2020 due to COVID. I was going down once every three months to hug him, hold him, interact with him. Since not being able to interact with him, I can see them him not doing so well. Um, he misses his family. The room that he's in is a cinder block room. It's very cold. It is very unpersonable. He deserves better than this. I've been working hard with Rich and Julie Jansen, with Proactive Living Facility, my family, myself, my friends raising money to bring my son home from Mississippi. He's 22 years old. He was diagnosed at the age of three. He is a fifth generation Montana and I am a fourth generation Montana. One minute. He deserves to be back home with his family. Um, we've been trying really hard. The state doesn't have facilities to care for him. He is also very low functioning, nonverbal. Um, the reason he went to Mississippi was because he was he needed to be regulated with medic medications and psychiatric help. I believe he's regulated somewhat to the point where he can come home now, but there isn't a place for him to go. That's why I'm highly in support of the Senate bill to help our adults with autism and the entire autistic community in Montana. So families and mothers like me don't have to be separated from their kids. I miss him desperately. Please support this bill. Thank you, Don. I appreciate your testimony. Next up is Mandy Lear. She's not online, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. Seeing no more online, do we have any opponents for Senate Bill, what is it, three, 478? I don't think we have any opponents online or in the room. Uh, any informational witnesses? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, William Evo, E, B as in Victor O. I currently serve as the Chief Healthcare Facilities Officer for DPHHS here informational. Thank you very much. Any other informational witnesses? 
Hello, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R. I am the Bureau Chief with the Developmental Disabilities Program with DPHHS here informationally. Thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no other informational witnesses online or in the room, we'll go to questions from the committee. Senator Molnar. Mr. Chairman, for the uh, informational witness from DPPHS. There were two of them. The fellow that just walked away. The man? You'll work. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, uh, I apologize, I mic, didn't hear. Pull that mic down just a little bit for yourself. Thank you very much. Too short. I, I apologize, I, I didn't hear um, which informational witness, so I thought I'd step up. I saw the man and remembered him. You'll do. If not, you can pass it on. Okay. Okay, Mr. Chairman, uh, your name, please. Uh, my name is Lindsay Carter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Carter. Uh, the facility in Mississippi we keep hearing about, what is so special about that, that any, say, large Victorian home with 10 bedrooms couldn't supply the same services to people here in Montana? Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the facility in Mississippi that has been referenced is what's called an intermediate care facility for indiv individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, it's a licensing type. Currently in Montana, we do not have an ICF IDD that serves children. Further question? Hello. Thank you for clarification. So if some caregivers went together bought a 10-bedroom uh, Victorian home and provided the same services. The only roadblock now is we don't have that license. We don't print it. It's not, is there a federal problem? Why would licensing be a problem? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, I think that um, from my perspective, there are services for individuals with autism in the community. They live in group homes. Um, specifically for children, there are not as many options. Uh, there's not as many providers who have chosen to operate licensed either group homes or um, ICFs. Final question for clarification. Uh if we sent out an RFP for providers for a facility in Montana, 10 beds, 20 beds, whatever it might be, and we had people respond, and we gave them the contract to run a house in Montana similar to the one in Mississippi for that specific population, would there be a barrier of any sort? Um. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, if it's okay, I would like to ref refer this question to Mr. Evo as he has been more involved in conversations around wait. ICF IDDs. Thank ahead. you. Mr. Evo, did you hear the question? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I heard the question, and um, with regard to, you know, getting into a discussion around licensing. Um, be happy to answer specific questions on the topic and follow up just to make sure getting you exactly uh, what you need. And it could also direct you to uh, the testimony that the department provided uh, for House Bill 5 as well, because we discussed the two 50-bed uh, facilities that were requested as a part of that funding. Thank you. All right. For the questions, um, Senator Beer, did you have a question? Yes. For the sponsor, please. Mr. Chairman, Senator. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Morjo, do you have a fiscal note for this? Um, Mr. Chair, Senator, there's no fiscal note that I've been provided with. Um, this uh, particular bill would, in the, the section three, provides that a transfer of funds would happen by August 1st, 2023, uh, in the amount of 200,000 for his general fund to be set up. So that would be the, the fiscal impact. Mr. Chair, follow up. Follow up. So, do you have, uh, uh, Senator Marshall, do you have a budget for establishing the new facility? Because I see where 
you said that it would be a one-to-one -one, uh, dollar match mm -hmm. for a facilities grant. So I just wondered if you could expand on that a bit. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Beard, um, thank you for the question. I think that's a good question. Uh, you know, in, in 2018, I remember um, having a, a conversation with Mr. Jansen, and at that time, um, we had discussed, uh, that was my the first term, session I was in, in the office in the house in 17, and we had had some conversations about the need or lack of facilities in Montana um, and how nothing had happened in Montana, or that, that we have no facilities. And so um, he, he basically told me, you know what, we're just going to go start doing everything we can to start making this happen. Um, so he, his family, um, friends, um, other individuals that you've, you've heard from who've been uh, been out trying to fundraise uh, money uh, went off on um, an endeavor to try and start raising money for this um, need that we just don't have in Montana. Um, and, you know, he's mentioned it to me uh, off and on. And then finally this session, I just said, you know what? I feel like we should be meeting you guys halfway. Um, and so when I initially requested this this legislation, um, I had 400,000 in it, um, and we know how hard it can be to, to, you know, squeeze money out in this building, uh, right? Especially when a lot of that money is before we even step into these rooms, people have already structured budgets, proposed budgets. Um, they have plans for that money. And so, you know, I really wanted to, to get things going for them. And I, I wanted to, to, you know, I wanted to, I didn't want to disappoint people, um, by asking for too much. Um, so, you know, you just heard that they've raised 400,000, um, they purchased nine acres. Um, they've been on the news, um, talking about the plans for the facility, um, to provide, you know, therapy, housing, and other support services. Um, when we talk about group homes, I, I think we, we heard that that's, that's just not happening. If, if we had group homes for, for, um, families that had, uh, uh, um, that was encompassing this need, we wouldn't be standing here in front of you today, right? Um, and so that's just, that's not really an option for a lot of people and especially with some of the, the care that is needed. Um, so, you know, really the, the budgetary amount I, I set out to, to try and help really supplement folks um, in any shape or form um, since they were out there busting their butts so hard to try and raise money to, to um, get things going, I, you know, I started with what I thought was um, hopefully a, a reasonable number to try and get through this building, which is why I set it at 200000 So, you know, uh, if, you know, you heard from uh, Mr. Schreiner and you've heard from Mr. Jansen, um, I certainly, I think, you know, if they raise another 100000 or 200,000, um, you know, us matching that, you know, makes that 400,000, you know, I think that's gonna be a pretty big um, help to them in their, in continuing their efforts. Thank you. For the questions? Senator, or Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, for Mr. Evo, please. Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Mr. Steve, oh, Mr. Chair, so so um, you you touched on uh, the 250 bed facilities that has come up in the budget. Yes, sir. Uh, as a possibility, does that fit the need for the intermediate care facilities that we talked about in this hearing? Can you be more specific with regard to the comment around fit? Uh, so so we were saying that the reason that these. Um, kids, young people are going to Mississippi is because we do not have an intermediate care facility here, is if we are putting in those 50 bed units, is does that fit the bill for an intermediate care facility? With regard to this question, you're talking about um, Ms. Carter's comment about um, ICFI ID and, and the presence of that facility being out of state, and that, that's the reason why these individuals yes. are going? Okay, and, yeah. and your, your question to me is around how could the proposal for the two ICFI ID facilities fit into the need of supporting Montanans with those types of challenges? Yes, I guess more importantly is that as we move forward, one of the things you were looking at for using those facilities for 
I think Ms. Carter could speak very eloquently to the, okay. the facility question as relates to the, um, the needs of these individuals. So I'll redirect to Ms. Carter could, if you don't um, mind. We have referred to Ms. Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carter, do I need to repeat the question or do you think you got it? Um, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Lenz, I think I understand the question. I believe your question is asking if the plans that have been proposed for these other facilities that have been discussed in different hearings, if that would meet the need of what Mr. Jansen is talking about, uh, need, wanting to have some matching funds to help build another facility well, in no, the community. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Carter, so if we are going to move forward with the facilities that's in this upcoming budget, and that one of the discussions was two 50-bed facilities, mental health and the sort of thing, you were the one that brought up the, the what was the term uh, that these kids have to go to? Um, it's an uh, intermediate care facility. Intermediate care facility. Would these facilities that we're looking at building be considered an intermediate uh, uh, facility? Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Chair Lenz, I believe that the I believe that in the, excuse, the reason why I referred that question to Mr. Evo was because I haven't been as involved in those plans. I believe that those facilities are geared more towards adults. Whereas the ICF IDD in Mississippi is specific for youth, okay. Mr. Chair. So, okay. uh, Ms. Carter and Mr. Evo, could you find that out for me? Absolutely. I think there's somebody that should be standing between you that would have the answer. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Lenz, I agree and I apologize that we don't have the uh, answer readily available. You betcha. And uh, one question for the sponsor, oh. Mr. Chair. Senator Morchel. Mr. Chair, Senator Lenz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Morjo. So, so the one thing I look at on this, and the driver, of course, is Mr. Jensen and what he's trying to accomplish. I am a little nervous with any bill that brings forward based on funding one project. Uh, and as I look at this, I'm just wondering if there shouldn't be a little more you know, Mr. Jensen is obviously a hard worker, cares about his son and what he wants to do. But we need to use our money responsibly. Um, uh, um, would you be open to maybe putting some sideboard language-wise in, in this bill? Mr. Chair, Senator Lyons, absolutely. I think, you know, the intent is definitely not just to fund one project. Um, uh, I think uh, Mr. Schreiner had talked about this as well in Great Falls, um, that they would, they're in need, they have a facility now, right? And, and they're exploring um, options for funding to help support that. So um, the intent is to, to make sure that we're looking at multiple ways to help different communities, not just one particular community. So absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Are there questions? I have a couple. Uh, for the sponsor, Senator Rojo, okay, you're uh, doing a one-to-one -one match for facilities. Um, I assume there must be some mechanism to determine where those grants would go, what facilities would be getting the grants, but I don't see anything in the bill that, at least I didn't see it, maybe you could point it out, that shows some mechanism to uh, allocate grants. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, the the I believe the bill would allow the program to be rulemaking to be set up by the department, um, so they'd be able to set up that rulemaking okay. process for administering the grants. So Got it. I tried to make it as simple as I could. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I see that now. Um, the one other question. So let's say you got the the one for one match and the facility is built, uh, then. Beyond that, is it, are you depending on, like, for the staffing and so forth, provider rates through Medicaid and things of that nature? Or? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, all of those things would play in uh, into the support that they need. And, and I think a couple of things do need um, some clarification. 
Um, you know, for for this particular program, it's actually uh, a permanent facility, and so it's it is different than um, the intermediary facilities that we just heard about. Um, also, when um, individuals have uh, severe autism, um, you can't you can't stuff them into rooms next door to each other. You have to actually uh, spread people out um, and. Um, for example, Mr. Jansen has some pretty good plans as far as how um, they put them in corners in different places so that they can um, easily uh, manage individuals. And so there's, there's a, a lot of things that go into this process that I think is, is worth, worth mentioning. Um, the, the, as you mentioned, you heard earlier too, the Mississippi facility is more designed towards intermediary and youth. This is designed, these facilities are, are more centered towards permanent care. Um, people who live here, you know, who can drive an hour or two to come see family versus, um, you know, not being able to see their child for, you know, three years. Um, so this this is a little bit different than, than the type of projects that you heard about um, earlier. So it would be, to wrap up on your question though, um, the resources, I think there's various parts of um, those resources that would be, um, and maybe Mr. Jansen could talk about the types of funding that they um, have currently um, and the services that they receive and what else would be used to, to help supplement um, and ensure that their care can uh, continue forward. Okay, okay, I have a question for Mr. Jansen. So Mr. Jansen, thank you for being here today. Um, just curious again, so we had intermediate facility, now we're at permanent facility. So what's your vision here? Once you have these facilities built, how are they staffed and and how is that staffing uh, funded? Can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, everything you've talked about, I've lived, I've rehearsed it in my mind. <clears throat> I'm the only one here, right? But the need is so much greater than just me and my son. You heard about Logan and Dylan in Mississippi. You know, they were children and they were brought there. They're now adults. Okay, there's no place for Jake in Montana, regardless of what is said here. They told us no to Jake. That's why he lives at home. What we're looking at is people like Jake have what they call a Medicaid waiver, which was fought very hard to get. The most severe have this. Less than 100 in Montana are given out and the only way someone gets one is if somebody dies okay so that's what would fund this facility along with his um, snap benefits that he gets every month and his social security for being a disabled american and montana which is about with with the cost of living um cpi is about 8500 a year all of that goes towards his care so the Medicaid waiver provides funding so Julie and I can work, right? So we can work and live and provide. Jake gets his caregiver. Um, you'll hear bills um, coming up soon to help increase their pay because it's hard work. It's hard work. He's, my son is not an easy guy. He's Most of the time he's nice. He is, but there are days when it's difficult. So that, that with um, continued fundraising, um, we looked at Farm in the Dell International, which has farms in Kalispell, Roundup, um, one near Billings. They are private nonprofits. They do the same things that we're going to do, except ours are permanent residential facilities for adults with autism where the population is there. We could fill them today. And I want to build more than one in Montana. I want to, if, if I could, sir, I would build them throughout the whole state, and that's our goal. Okay, we're just the, we're just the start. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions from the committee, uh, would the senator like to close on his bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Um, so, you know, what you heard is that the, the funding would be uh, come from multiple sources, right, for that continued care. Um, we can't even get to that point though if we don't have a facility, um, and and you know that's goal number one is to get a facility to to make sure that people in Montana um, have a place to to um, a permanent care facility for their children who and adults 
adult children who um, um, suffer from with autism. Um, one thing I think is important to, to know as well with this bill is, you know, right now, if we support Montanans um, who go to Mississippi, that's Montana money going out of state. Um, if we're employing people at these facilities, that's jobs here in Montana. Um, and we're keeping, not only are we keeping people closer to their families so that they can see them. Um, you know, I think the example was, you know, Jay could go home and um, spend time with his parents to get an apple, right? Um, those are the sorts of small things that add up. Um, and, and a lot of it is also, part of it is sometimes it's a transition for, um, for that, um, these adults as well with their families. So, um, you know, I think this is, it, it, it just makes a lot of sense on a lot of levels. Um, it's not a big ask. Um, I think, you know, we're, I said earlier, I want to meet folks halfway. We're not even meeting them halfway here. I think they've, they went beyond halfway. We're meeting them, you know, we're, we're taking 10 steps out when they've walked miles. So, um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll close. Thank you. This closes the hearing on Senate Bill 478. Uh, members of the committee will take about a six or seven minute break, be back at six, and we'll start our next hearing.